and an entrepreneur, I get asked these questions quite a bit. What is this coding thing? Should my kids learn how to code? And finally, how do I prepare my kids for the future? I get asked these so often that I decided, you know what, I'm just going to do a talk. <laughs> uh, and then next time when somebody asks me, I'll just point them to, uh, to, to this talk. So thank you for um, having me here and um, thank you for saving me time for the next three years or so. <laughs> How do we prepare our kids for the future? When you think about the future, what do you, what, what is the imagery that you have in your head? I'll tell you what I have in my head. Uh, product of the 80s, you know, the Terminator uh, robots just, just trying to uh, conquer the world. Well, luckily, reality is not as scary as this. You see here, there are two uh, couple of videos of, of the latest robot projects. Um, the, the left one, this one is actually my own project that I'm working on. Um, and as you can see, the robot is just simply transporting things from one place to another. And this is considered state of the art, so it's not that scary, it's not quite Terminator ready. Um, but the other one is a, the other video is a robot by Boston Dynamics, and whenever we try to get the robot to do something a little more sophisticated, guess what happens? Now everything doesn't go exactly the way it's supposed to. <laughs> but the truth is that revolution is coming. And according to some people, in as little as uh, 15 years, according to some, that a lot of our jobs will be taken over by AI and by robotics. And what's left over are the complex and creative jobs, if you believe this slide. And a lot of people get nervous about this, right? And kept thinking, oh, what should I do? You know, how am I going to lose my job? The truth is that we've been on this trajectory forever, it turns out, that ever since computer technology happens, that appear on the scene, we've been trying to automate our lives. We're trying to save time, save energy, and so on. The very first killer app, if you will, uh, for the personal computer is called a spreadsheet. We now um, know Excel and Google Sheets, but the very first version is actually called VisiCalc. And this is what VisiCalc's creator has to say. It took 20 hours of work and compress it and make it only 15 minutes for some people. And these are accountants that they're referring to. But it's the last word that got me really interested. It says here that let them be more creative. I don't think of accounting as creative, um, <laughs> personally, but I'm sure that there are, there, there are a lot of creative accountants out there. But when I thought of creativity, this is who I thought about. Right? Um, Bob Ross has become like a bit of a mini internet sensation. I've been binging Bob Ross actually with my kids. And I got so inspired by creativity that I figured, you know what, I'm going to try doing some painting myself. Hit my first hurdle. My first hurdle is I got to actually buy this starter kit. <laughs> and so on Amazon, I don't know, like 50 bucks or so, I bought the starter kit. But then I realized something. It's actually harder than it looks. I have to now learn how all those different brushes work. Do you know there are different size brushes? And then there's this complicated thing called a knife, and I have no idea how when to use the knife. Of course, you've got a mixed pain and everything. And then the canvas itself has different absorption rate. So I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so technical. So it turns out that being creative isn't like this free form creativity that Bob Ross made. You know, he's, he's always all relaxed and just be able to create anything. It's not quite true. There are a lot of intricacies. And to be truly creative, we actually have to understand the tools of the trade, if you will. Just like if you want to be creative with accounting, you need to know your numbers. If you, need to, if you want to be creative uh, with your writing, your English skills or your language skills has to be really good and so on and so forth. Creativity then is always constrained. There's no such thing as kind of free form creativity. If we were to train our future, train our kids, to face the future, um, what kind of creativity 
Are we training them? What kind of constraints are they under? Is it coding? That's what I want to ask. Is it coding? There's going to be this constraint um, that, that we're working under. It seems like our government is be believe that that's true. There's a lot of money being invested into classrooms to teach people how to code. In fact, I, I don't know if you know, but in the K-12 curriculum, coding is now mandatory. And it's mandatory since 2016. And this projection of coding jobs is going to take over the world. What I want to ask though is that, is coding really the key then? If you learn how to code, are we going to all of a sudden become complex and creative powerhouses? I have been teaching coding for the last 20 years. And I can tell you that no, my students don't become creative and complex powerhouses just like that. When we think of coding, we actually want to do this. We want them to achieve, um, to work for or, or, or create companies like these, right? Create the Netflix of the world, create Minecraft, a very popular video game, Cre um, work, work for Disney and maybe Apple. These companies, to me, is actually not technology company. Yes, they use coding, but they're not technology company. To me, what they are doing is using coding to deliver creativity to their audience. You may ask, hey, what about Apple? Apple is as tech as it gets. Why would Apple be part of this um, creativity? Well, according to Steve Jobs, Apple's DNA, it, it, in Apple's DNA is that technology alone is not enough, and technology has to be married with the liberal arts and the humanities and the result will make our hearts sing. Well, he said this quite a few years ago. I think that is not quite far enough. I think that if I were to say it right now, I would say that technology is the canvas in which we deliver creativity to others. When you go visit a website, a beautiful website, are you, well, I mean, you're not me, right? I would actually admire the code that's underneath. <laughs> but you don't admire the code that's underneath. You admire how easy it is to navigate, how easy, how, how easy it is to get the information that you want. When you watch the latest blockbuster movie that has lots of CGI, um, do you admire the algorithms that's created for all those animations? Well, I do, once again, but you probably don't. You just admire the big battle scenes, you know, they're able to put no spoilers. <laughs> They're able to put lots of uh, people into a battle, right? Um, it's, it's the marriage. It, it is the marriage of the arts and technology that's going to drive our future. And if we were to prepare our kids for the future, that's what I want to say to them, is we need to combine the arts and the science together. So it's easier said than done, though. So, why am I? Why do I care about this? Why do I care about teaching kids how to code? Well, sure, I have kids and people ask me questions, but when do I find time to deal with this? I'll share a little bit with you about my personal journey. About three years ago, I got into a pretty bad car accident. I was riding my bike and I got T-boned by an SUV and I ended up being in the hospital. And I spent about a year um, up on disability. Now, during that year of disability, I was just sitting at home, a little depressed. And I remember, this is 2017, right? my wife actually turned to me and she asked me two questions. First question is, do you know how to code? I was like, I've been paying our mortgage for the last 20 years. I think I know a little bit about how to code. But it's actually, well, I mean, she, she's smarter than that. She actually knows what she's doing. And she really wanted to ask me the second question, and that is, if you're sitting at home and you know how to do this, can you teach the kids how to code? It got me thinking a little bit. I've always taught post-secondary. I've taught um, essentially adults. I, I, I didn't quite understand what it means to teach teach kids. Are we going to turn grade six, all grade sixes into software engineers? It makes no sense at all whatsoever. So, and of course I have time on my hands, so I decided to think about this problem a little bit. I started running experiments, and I start with my own kids first, and then I'm going to different classrooms and talking to different teachers. So these are some of the experiments that I ran, and I started running workshops with kids. And I realized 
a couple of things that's really interesting. Now, once again, we want to tell kids to combine technology with their creativity. What I realize is that we have been doing a really good job especially at the elementary school level, teaching kids creativity already. I was at this little um, take your, uh, or pretend to be a student day uh, at my kids' school, and they were giving us exercises like dance lessons and, and, and singing lessons and so on, right? All within the elementary classroom. Kids are great and our teachers are great at bringing out the creativity in kids. And that's the second thing I realized, that kids love technology, you know? The good old saying, right, if you have a problem with your phone or your computer, who do you go to? Who do you find? You find a teenager. <laughs> they are able to fix it for you. In our household, I find my, um, I find my 12 year old and she'll be able to fix stuff for me too. So they love technology. All they need to do, all, all we need to do um, in order to show them uh, this combination or, or this marriage of tech and creativity is to give them a vehicle. We, all we need to do is to open it up to them, give them a way so that they can combine it. It sounds really abstract, so I'll give you one example. And I only have time to give you one example. So this is a, from a workshop that I run with um, some, some of the kids. And as you can see on the uh, left, or on the right hand side, you can see that there's a spaceship moving around. But on the left hand side, you can see the code that's actually enabling that to happen. So, and here, we have computer code combining things like photography. The background is a 360 degree image. We combine a little, a little bit of mathematics. We com uh, there's no sound on this particular, um, uh, on the slide, but there's actually sound on, on the product. So you can see there's play sound there. Um, and there's 3D modeling because the spaceship is actually a 3D model that the students create. And all within a couple of hours, they're able to put this together. It's delightful if you give, and I experience this over and over again. Whenever I go run a workshop, I don't do a lot of teaching. I show them a couple of things. I show them what's possible. And the kids themselves, they just put it together. Did I mention that this is from a grade six class? It's a pretty amazing thing. We, they can create already. We just have to enable them. The word STEM has been thrown around quite a bit. Is one of these buzzword, buzzwords, if you will. It stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it's often said that that is the future of education. It is true. I mean, we need all that sciences, and coding is part of this. We need all these because that is the infrastructure that we have. That is the infrastructure of modern society. But I think if we only give them STEM education, it's not enough. If we really want to prepare them for the future, future where even STEM jobs can be automated, we need to add the little extra A into STEM. It's called STEAM, and it includes the arts. And we are talking about liberal arts, we're talking about humanities, we're talking about creative arts. And only through the combination and full integration of all these fields will, our, will, will, will we be able to prepare our kids well. Every time I go to a workshop, I'm always delighted by how amazing these kids can pick up the technology and be able to combine it in, in, in amazing ways. You can call me an optimist, but I'm really honored um, to be part of their journey, and I want to continue to be part of the journey, but I really can't wait you know, when I get old and gray to see what kind of wonderful applications and wonderful products that is going to enhance our lives. Uh, that these kids are going to create, and I hope you will be too. Thank you.